Okay, church, are you ready? Take a deep breath. Here we go. <laughs> I've got a lot to say today. <laughs> so, but uh, I believe, I truly believe, in this past few weeks, I really had a sense in my spirit that God is positioning us and He's setting us up and He's positioning us for 2022. With that positioning comes a clearing out and a cleaning out. And like a, a vessel said yesterday, it's like a house. You spring clean it. You know, you move the, the furniture and you make sure all the dust and all the cobwebs and all the things are cleaned out properly. And then you put the furniture back into place. And that is what I'm sensing in the spirit, that God is really positioning us. And I want you to pray into that and also to connect yourself for that, even in your household, your marriage, your business, your ministry, that you will connect to that repositioning in the spirit because I'm really believing that God is setting us up for greater things in the year to come. And it's not just a, a frivolous uh, declaration, I believe it with my heart. If I can read the spirit and I can sense the oppression and the things, you know, it's like a, a couple of weeks we are feeling like a boxing match in the spirit. And I believe that God is positioning us and looking forward to what he's going to do. Can I have an amen to that? Amen. So I'm speaking on sonship and I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best to continue in this. And I, I want to lay this morning a, a solid foundation for something that I'm moving towards in the next year by God's grace. And I'm speaking about sons that are anointed as priests of righteousness. And uh, it's just a foundation because I'm going to give you the scriptures. And I, I ask you that you will go back to the scriptures and study them and fastening them in your hearts and Put it into your hearts because we are going to build upon that word. And we are actually just touching the top, the surface of this topic because there's such a depth into it. And this truth or this foundational truth is not preached often in the church. We don't hear often that we as sons are anointed as priests of righteousness because we acknowledge Jesus as our high priest, our true high priest. But as we continue through the scriptures, you will see it's unfolding something, unfolding a deeper truth. And also, we need to understand, when I, when I release this word into the spirit, we need to understand, sometimes we listen to people, and I know that you're listen to, listening to other preachers and other teachings, but there's a, there's, a, there's a sound measurement to measure doctrine. And we did that a couple of uh, years ago in the word school. But another thing to measure sound doctrine is to understand that the Spirit of God will never take you where the Word cannot sustain you. Listen to this. The Spirit of the Lord will never take you to places where the Word cannot carry it or sustain it. We can step into the possibilities of heaven knowing that we are safe within the boundaries of the word. I touched on this, the previous uh, anointing service. There is such a vast possibilities in heaven and we are seated with Christ in heavenly places and we are safe within the boundaries of the word. We are not safe in our experiences because experiences are subjective to our understanding and even our doctrine but when we're stepping into the spirit and we have the word as a foundation and an anchor, we will always be safe and sound in what we hear and in what we do. We cannot put spiritual experiences on the same level of authority than the word. Come on. I cannot preach my experiences as if it is the word of God. That's why I say the Spirit cannot take you where the Word cannot sustain you because you get weird and wonderful teachings out there. But when you measure it on the Word of God, when you put it on the Word, it falls short. And that is a safe place for us to go and understand. So when we speak of priests of righteousness, then the foundation must be in the Word so that we don't shoot off in 
weird things, but understanding the purpose and the design of sonship and what the role, what is the role and function as a son of God. Amen. So I believe that we have an ear to hear this morning and we have eyes to see. The last time we spoke about we are no longer slaves. We are born again and God brought us from slavery into sonship. And he did that by his spirit and by his word and by his blood. So we already identified in Revelation 1 verse 5 to 6. He says, unto him that loved us. Ah and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. So he made us something because he says he became sin so that we can become the righteousness of God. So there's a making, there's a becoming. But he loved us, he's washed us in, us in his own blood, and then he made us kings. He gave us authority with him and he made us also priests, and this is what we are going to focus on today. 1 Peter 2 verse, 9, 2, 2 verse 9 to 10, it confirms that word. It says, but you are a chosen race. You are a race uniquely and supernatural because you are born again of God. You're a new creation. You're a new race. Nothing like you existed before. Come on, church. Nothing like you existed before. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's own purchased special people. Turn to somebody and say, you're a special people. <laughs> a special people. Why? That you, listen, that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are called to show forth. You are called to shine, arise, shine, for your light has come. You are called out of darkness into this marvelous light to show forth and to set forth something, wonderful deeds, and display the virtues and perfections of Him. Ah, hallelujah. And I think it's not so perfect. Praise the Lord. He is perfect. He has qualified us. He, he qualified and is making us perfect. It is like that song. It is he in us that is perfect. Amen. Jesus is our great high priest and he ascended and is positioned for a certain purpose. Come on, church. He ascended. He's not there swinging his feet and, you know, twiddling his thumbs, you know, like the children sit on a swing or a, you know, sitting there, there's a specific purpose why he ascended. Because the word says in Hebrews 4, he, he, um, inasmuch then as we have a great high priest who has already ascended and passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession of faith in him. For we do not have a high priest, listen to those who are crying out in their hearts, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses and infirmities and liability to the assaults of temptation. Come on, church. But one who has been tempted in every respect as we are yet without sinning. Let us, because of that, because he can sympathize and empathize with us. He knows what we are going through. He says, let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy. Who needs mercy this morning? Yes, we need mercy this morning. Listen, for our failures, come on. We need mercy for our failures and find grace to help in good time for every need. Hallelujah. There is mercy available and grace available, but draw near to him fearlessly and with great confidence. Ephesians 2, so he is seated with the Father and he ascended through the heavens and he's there to give us mercy. He's there to show us grace. And then Ephesians 2 verse 6 says, and he raised us up together with him. 
and made us sit down together, giving us joint seating with him in the heavenly sphere by virtue of our being in Christ Jesus. So he ascended and he is seated at the right hand of our Father, but he took us with him. I want you to see you, you are located in heavenly places. He moved you. He moved your spirit from darkness into the light. And you are seated with him and you are in him. By virtue of being in him, you are seated with him and you are seated in the same function as our Lord Jesus Christ, as our high priest. Come on, church. Because we are the royal priesthood. We are called to be, we are made priests and kings. And so we have joint seating with Christ and we are seated with him in that heavenly calling. The translation, Passion Translation says, Jesus, our compassionate king priest, so then we must cling in faith to all we know to be true. For we have a magnificent king priest, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who rose into the heavenly realm for us and now sympathizes with us in our frailty. He understands humanity, for as a man, our magnificent king priest was tempted in every way, just as we are, and conquered sin. So now we draw near freely, and boldly to where, to where grace is enthroned, to receive mercy's kiss and discover the grace we urgently need to strengthen us in our time of weakness. Come on. Powerful word. Powerful word. Jesus' ministry is in the heavenlies. He ascended. He's no longer here in physical form. That's why we see the body. He left his body. But he ascended and his ministry is now in the heavenlies. And we are sharing that calling. We are sharing that ministry because we are seated with him. We are so struggling with earthly stuff that we are forgetting that we are seated with him. Come on, church. We are so much intimidated by circumstances that we forget that we are, our location is no longer here. Our location is with him. And he is seated above all rule and authority. And Hebrews 3 verse 1 says, So then, brethren and sisters, consecrated and set apart for God, who share in the heavenly calling. Come on. Come on. There's a calling that ascends your earthly ministry. Come on. There's a calling. There's a heavenly calling that ascends earthly ministry. And this is the calling, and this is the ministry of a priest, because we are co-laborers with God. Amen? We know that scripture. Romans 8, verse 33 to 34 gives us a glimpse into this ministry, this priestly ministry, mercy and grace. But then Romans 8, verse 33 says, who shall, listen to this, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? When God who justifies, who puts us in right relationship with himself, who shall come forward and accuse or impeach those whom God has chosen? Come on. Come on, church. Come on. We are so easily accused. We feel so easily self-condemned and condemned and judged. Come on. But the scripture says, who shall? Who shall, if God has put you right with himself through Jesus Christ, who can accuse you? Who can come forward and accuse or impeach those whom God has chosen? Come on. Not even yourself. You cannot even put yourself under when God has put you up. Come on. You cannot put yourself under if God has lifted you up with Christ into heavenly places. Whatever that thought is, whatever that fiery dart is that is piercing your mind is a lie from the devil. Because God, he made you righteous. He justified you. He made you right with him in Christ. 
No one can take that away. Come on, church. He says, who is there to condemn us? Will Christ Jesus, who died, or rather who raised, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, actually pleading as he intercedes for us, do you think Christ will accuse you? Come on. He who gave his life for you, who shed his blood for you, who made you to become righteous, who became your sin on the cross, do you think he is the one that is accusing you? Come on. It's a lie. It's a lie. And we believe these things as if it is the truth. Then the word says, through the blood and the spirit, there is a working and there's an operation of the blood together with the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 9 verse 14 says, how much more surely, how much more surely, how much more surely shall the blood of Christ, who by virtue of his eternal spirit, his own preexistent divine personality has offered himself as an unblemished sacrifice to God, purify our consciences from dead works and lifeless observances to serve the ever-living God. His blood by the eternal spirit. It's not a temporary thing. It's not bound to a timeline. There's an operation in the spirit and through the blood. He says, therefore, he is the negotiator and mediator of an entirely new agreement, a testament so that those who are called and offer it may receive the fulfillment of the promised everlasting inheritance. Colossians 1 verse 20 says, and through him the Father make peace by means of the blood of the cross. The ministry of a priest is to mediate between God and man. But if we join our Lord Jesus Christ as a priest, as a right priest of righteousness, sons understanding that they are also priests, we also become mediators. We also become reconciliators because we have been given the ministry of reconciliation to unite and reconcile man back to God, understanding that Jesus, through him, he made peace with man through the blood of Jesus. God is not angry with you. Amen. That is a lie that God is angry with you and waiting to get you. Come on. God made peace with us. He made peace with man because he poured out his wrath on Jesus Christ on the cross. And Jesus became the perfect full measure sacrifice for sin that separated us from God. He paid the full perfect price for every sin, for every failure, for every trespass, church. He paid that price. And when you receive that, something breaks over you. But we are so proud that we think that our self-condemnation, it is making us more worthy. Come on. It's making us more worthy to receive his forgiveness. It is your pride that, th that is thinking that God cannot forgive you. It is your pride that thinks that God cannot set you free or the other person free. It is your selfish pride setting you up that do not receive the grace of our Lord Jesus, the mercy of God that was poured forth from that blood and from that cross. You are not greater than the blood of Jesus. No sin is greater than the blood of Jesus. Come on, church. If you think that, you are trapped in a lie. You are trapped in a lie. Or you're trapped in your own mindset and in your fleshly mindset. He says, and yet now Christ the Messiah reconciled you to God in the body of his flesh through death. 
in order to present you holy and faultless and irreproachable in his Father's presence. Many times we think that God looks at us or looks at people the way we do, the way we look at ourselves, the way we look at people, with measurements and judgments and all these foolish things. But when God looks to us, church, He's looking like these glasses on my, on my eyes. He's looking through the blood of Jesus to us. If these glasses could be read this morning, you will understand. He's looking to you through the blood. He's looking through the sacrifice that Jesus made. He's looking and he sees a pure innocence before him. Come on, church. He sees you reconciled. He sees you forgiven. He sees you restored. He sees you identified with God and with Christ. He sees you seated with him in heavenly places. He sees you as a son, not a slave of sin. He sees you as a priest of the Most High. He sees you in that lie, in that light. Anything else is a lie. Anything else is a lie. So we need to deal with our own insecurities. We need to deal with our own mindsets. We need to deal. It must be renewed by the Spirit in our mind. It must be renewed by the Word so that we can align ourselves with the truth. Come on, church. We measure one another. We test one another. We condemn one another. But when God looks at us, he sees a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation before him. And the word says in 1 John 7, but if we really are living and walking in the light, come on, if you're really living habitually, make it your habit to live in the light, walking in the light, as he himself is in the light, come on church, there is no darkness in him. And if we are really connected to him in heavenly places, and we are walking and living with him through the intimacy and the communion with him, daily communion with him, and I'm speaking of a relationship, fellowshipping with him daily. He says, as he himself is in the life, light, listen, we have true, unbroken fellowship with one another first. If we are walking in the light, there's unbroken fellowship in the body of Jesus Christ because there's a unity. Because if I'm walking in the light and you're walking in the light and you are walking in the light and Marcus, you are walking in the light, we have fellowship in the light. And then the word says, and the blood of Jesus, when we are walking in this light, the blood of Jesus, his sons, his son cleanses. There is a perpetual cleansing. There's a continuous cleansing and a washing. It says it, it, it cleanses us from all sin and guilt. Come on. Sin and guilt. Because where there's sin, there's judgment. Where there's judgment, there's guilt. Come on. But if we have fellowship with him in the light, there's a continual washing and a cleansing, not just from the sin, but also from the guilty feelings, the self-condemnation, the self-judgment and judging others. He says it keeps us cleansed from sin. Hallelujah. In all its forms and manifestations. Glory to Jesus. One thing is blood. When we walk in the light, what is the light? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I walk in the word, there's an operation of the blood upon my life, washing me, cleansing me, and, it's, and also from sin and guilt, but also keep me clean from all sin in it, all its forms and manifestations. Wow. Amen. That's a good one. That was a good one to say amen. Come on, church. That's a good one. 
it's time for us to move on. In the beginning of the year, I said this year is going to be the year of manifestation. And I believe it with my heart. And the word that I gave was in Hebrews 6, where Paul says, or the writer of Hebrews 6, 6 of Hebrews says that, he says in verse 1, therefore, let us go on and get past the elementary stage in the teachings and doctrine of Christ, advancing steadily towards the completeness and perfection that belongs to spiritual maturity. Do you remember that word? And then he gives the foundation, six foundational stones or six foundations of our, of our life in Christ. In verse 3 it says, if indeed God, God permits, we will now proceed to advance teaching. And I said to, to you, I believe God said, Elma, you can go. The gate is open. We can advance. And we are, have been steadily advancing into things because the writer is speaking of this priesthood and he is referring to the priesthood of Melchizedek that we are mentioned in Genesis and that mentioned especially in Hebrews. And he said, there are things that I want to share with you. If we are going to advance in teaching, then I want to speak to you about Melchizedek. I want to speak to you about this priesthood. I want to speak to you about that you are priests with him and that you are part of this priestly order. And then he starts to describe it he says in verse 1, Hebrews 7, because in 6 he says, let us advance. And then you will see, he says, I could not speak to you because things are not in place and you are not mature enough to hear these things. But in chapter 7, he could not help himself. He says, let us speak about Melchizedek. <laughs> let us speak about him. He said, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, which means Jerusalem, king of peace, and priest of the Most High God, met Abraham as he returned from the slaughter of the king and blessed, blessed him. That's Genesis 14. You, go, you can go back and read that. And Abraham gave to him a tenth portion of all the spoils. So we can see that tithing is not underneath the law only. It was before the law was given, 430 years before the law was given. Abraham gave a tithe to this priest. And then he says, he is primarily, as his name when translated indicates, king of righteousness. This priest is a king. And this king is the king of righteousness. What did Jesus say in Revelation 1? I've made you kings and priests of the most high God. Amen. And then he says, and then he is also king of Salem, which means king of peace. Without, listen to this, without record of father or mother or ancestral line, neither with beginning of days nor ending of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues to be a priest without interruption and without successor. So we see it's not a natural thing. This, this priesthood is not a natural institution like the Levites were in the Old Testament because they died. They had mothers and fathers, and there was an ancestral line. But this priesthood that is connected to the Son of God, it is an eternal priesthood. It's a perpetual priesthood that has no beginning and it has no end, says the word. He says now, if perfection had been attainable by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people were given the law, why was it further necessary that there should arise another and different kind of priest, one after the order of Melchizedek? He says, for when there's a change in priesthood, there is of necessity an alteration of the law. So God came and he changed the whole game. When in the Old Testament he had a certain rhythm and a rites and a, and a religion. Now he came and he changed it all. He said, these guys is just a foreshadow of something real. The Levitical priest is just a shadow of a greater priesthood. They are only prophesying and resembling a greater priesthood. But these priests, they die and they, they fall short. But there's a priesthood that will never fall short, that will never die, that is always interceding, come on church, always ministering unto God on our behalf, come on. 
always praying for you. Jesus neither sleeps nor slumber. He prays for you constantly. There's a ministry in heaven, and that ministry is towards God for us. And when we understand that and we step into sonship, we are stepping into that same ministry, and we started to intercede for, for, for one another. We start to speak for one another. We start to call grace upon one another. We start to call mercy upon. When I see you making mistakes, I call upon the grace of God for you. When I see you are struggling as a priest of the Most High, I step into that ministry, and I pray for you. Our work is mostly unseen. Sunday is just, it's just a day. Our work, ministry work, is mostly unseen because it's in the heavenlies. It's in the heavenly realm, praying, interceding, seeking, asking for you. Amen? And that is the, the, the righteous sons of God. And now he says, he says, and this becomes more plainly evident when another priest arises who bears the likeness of Melchizedek, who has been constituted a priest, not on the basis of a bodily legal requirement, an externally imposed command concerning his physical ancestry. Jesus did not come from Levites. He came from the tribe of Judah. In that, God already changed the whole plan. He changed the whole order, and he rectified something in the, that is true in the spirit. He says, but on the basis of the power, listen, Jesus did not qualify because he was ancestral correct. Come on. He did not qualify because he was a Levite. He qualified on the basis of the power of an endless, indestructible life. I'm going to say that again. He qualified as a priest on the basis of the, on the power of the power of an endless, indestructible life. No beginning, no end. Eternal. So a previous physical regulation and command is canceled because of its weakness and ineffectiveness and uselessness. For those who want to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, I don't know what Bible you are reading because the word says it was weak, it was ineffective, and it was useless. How can we want to restore something, a priesthood? How can we restore that priesthood if there's already a priest in heaven, a true high priest interceding and ministering for us? Amen? He says further, the Lord has sworn and will not regret it or change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In keeping with the oath, greater strength and force, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better agreement, a more excellent and more advantageous covenant. Can I have an amen there? Even if you don't understand anything or everything, I'm speaking into your spirit. I'm laying a foundation in your spirit. Amen? Just receive. I know it's a mouthful. It says, but he holds his priesthood unchangeable. It's not, never, ever going to change. Listen, church. This priesthood, this ministry, this heavenly ministry will never, ever change. He is a priest to us and for us forever. And we are connected to that ministry by being a son of God. Therefore, he is able to save, listen, listen. He is able to save the uttermost. Can I go amen, cry? Slaap jylle. Ga half my water. Uh, Mozambique, when I was ministering in Mozambique, 50 degrees Celsius, I, I kid you not, in a sink kaya, and they closed the doors. I could dry my clothes like this, and then at one stage, I could just see the white of their eyes. It was like, I took water, and I called upon the fire of God, and I just called, and I said, in the name of Jesus, 
I called the fire, and as I called the fire, I threw the water over them. Well, it was the spirit or the water. They became awake. And I could preach, amen. But that was one of the most eesh, challenging experiences because of the heat. It is as if the sun is directly upon your skin, burning you, the, the heat of that degrees. And so it says, listen, church, therefore he is able. Say with me, he's able. To save, say with me, to save the uttermost. There's nothing, no one that he cannot save. Amen. There is not one sin that he cannot forgive. Not one. And then he says, he says, finally, and for all time, listen, he can save to the uttermost completely, perfectly, finally, and for all time and eternity, those who come to God through him, since he is always living, Leicester, is always living to make petition to God and intercede with Him and intervene for them. Come on. When you think nobody is praying for you, when you think nobody is seeing you, when you think nobody is hearing the cry of your heart, this Lord Jesus that we serve is a true king and a priest, and he is intervening for you. He's interceding for you. And the moment we as sons understand that ministry and we connect to that, we also start to intervene. We also start to intercede. We also start to forgive. We also start to bring reconciliation. Come on, church. Come on, church. Here is the high priest perfectly adapted to our needs. <laughs> Can you believe it? He's adapted to our needs. He's adapted to our needs. Wow, what a grace. As was fitting, holy, blameless, unstained by sin, separated from sinners, and exalted higher than the heavens. Because he met all the requirements once for all. Say with me, once for all. When he brought himself as a sacrifice, which he offered up. But the word of God's oath, which was spoken later after the institution of the law, chooses and appoints as priests one whose appointment is complete and permanent, a son who has been made perfect forever. Ah, hallelujah. And we share that. We are seated in that. Come on. We are seated in that. We are seated with him. And as we realize, and as you meditate upon this, see yourself seated with him in heavenly places, and then you start to listen. Just listen in the spirit. What will you hear? Prayers for you. Interventions for you. Calling out your name. Come on, church. That is what you're going to hear when you listen, if you sit in that place with him. John 17, and I'm closing. John 17 verse 3 says the following, and this is life eternal. We think life eternal is when you kick the bucket and there you go. Seated with your star in heaven, you know, while the wife and husband is suffering here on earth, you are gone with the Lord. He says, listen to this, and this is eternal life that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. To know him is eternal life. To know him, to be connected to him, eternal life is already resident within you. It's already there within you. It is already in operation within you. In this frail human body, eternal life is alive and well, people. Come on, church. Eternity is already within you. That's why you are a peculiar people. You're a royal priesthood. You're a chosen generation. You're, there's nothing and no one like you.
touch yourself and say, eternity dwells here. Eternity, eternal life is already within you. And then I want to read to you understanding eternal, to understand eternal. Andrew Murray says, is one of my favorite writers. He was a Dutch Reformed preacher in Worcester. You know that beautiful church in Graf Reinet. Um, it's one of the most beautiful churches I've ever seen. And this man's, his writings are very profound. They are easily looked over because the simplistic truth is set forth in such a, such a beautiful but uncomplicated way that you can easily miss what he is saying. You know what I'm saying? But when you read this man's heart, and you read it, he says, everything that exists in time, and we live by time, no? has a beginning and is subject to the law of increase and decrease, of becoming and decaying. That is everything that exists in time. What is eternal has no beginning and knows no change or weakening because it has in itself a life that is independent of time. Come on. Eternal, eternal life is already here. There's no increase or decrease. Come on, church. Come on. There's no becoming or decaying. There's no change or weakening because it's eternal. It is within you. In what is eternal, there is no past that has already disappeared and is lost, and there's no future yet to possess. It is eternal. There's not a coming and a going. It is eternal. It is always a glorious, endless present. Now faith is. Present faith. Now faith. Christ in us now. Life now. Then he says, now when scripture speaks of eternal life, eternal redemption, eternal joy, it means much more than to say merely that they will have no end. Come on. There's no end to your redemption. There's no end to joy. There's no end to this life that is already within you. Doesn't matter what any other preacher tells you. Come on, church. Does it doesn't matter because it's not based on this word, on this truth. He says, by the word eternal, we are taught that he who has a share in eternal blessedness possesses something in which the power of an endless life is at work. There is a power, Ephesians 3, working in you and for you. Remember that scripture? There's a power working in you, but also for you. It pulls you forward. It pulls you into this eternal dimension. And then it says, there's a blessedness to it. Come on, church. There's a blessing because it is not, it's not subject to corruption. It's not subject to human frailty because it has a power in itself to sustain itself within you. That is the eternal spirit. Are you with me? If it is something in which there can be no change, nor can it suffer any diminution, therefore we may always enjoy it in the fullness of its life-bestowing blessings. Because you are carrying eternal life, you are blessed. You are blessed. The objective of Scripture in using that word is to teach us that if our faith, listen to this, that if our faith lays a hold on what is eternal, if you can lay hold and if you can meditate and you start to understand what is this power that is already operating in you and for you. There's no end. There's no beginning. There's no increase. There's no decrease. There's not a becoming. There's not a past. There's not a future. It's now working within me. If you can lay hold on it with your faith, it will manifest in us as a power superior to all the fluctuations of our minds 
and our feelings, because faith is not a feeling. Come on, church. We cannot rely on our emotions. We cannot rely on our feelings. But if we lay hold through faith on this eternal presence, this eternal now, something happens within us. He says, when we lay hold of this church, a youth that will never grow old is yours. And with a freshness that does not for a moment waver. Come on. Come on, church. I agree it is a backfall. I know it's a mouthful. But I know that if your spirit receives this and you start to meditate upon it, and you start to lay hold on eternal life, you lay hold on it, if something is going to change, not just in your spirit, in your mind and in your body. There will be a youthfulness because there's no increase and no decrease in this life. There's not a young and an old. Come on. There's not a young and an old. It is now. It is present. And the word I said to Paul this morning, I had three messages. And I said to him, which one? Which one for today? And in the night, I saw a word in, in bold letters, capital letters, forgiven. Just today, forgiven. And Hebrews 9 verse 14 says, and I'm going to repeat this, how much more surely, how much more surely shall the blood of Christ, who by virtue of his eternal spirit has offered himself as an unblemished sacrifice to God, purify our consciences from dead works and lifeless observances to serve the ever-living God. And I want to declare over you this morning, being a son, I am part of that priesthood. Being a son, you're part of that priesthood, the order of Melchizedek, because you are seated with him. Being a son, we are there to reconcile. We are there to give mercy. We are there to give grace. We are there to intercede. We are there to forgive. We are there to forgive is part of who I am. Church, to forgive becomes part of who you are. You are a priest. You are a priest of the Most High. It flows from us because I am forgiven. Come on. I am forgiven. I have received grace. I have received mercy. Therefore, I can give. Freely I have received, and freely I can give. John 20, and this I want to close with. John 20, verse 21 to 23. Then Jesus said to them, it's after his resurrection, and he came. And they were in a closed environment venue. And the word says, and he came and stood among them. He just appeared. He just stood there, and he appeared among them. And he said, peace to you. Peace to you. Just as the Father has sent me forth, so I am sending you. It sounds the same as at the Great Commission, when Jesus said, go and make disciples. But this is the first time he spoke to his disciples in this private environment. And he showed them his, the scars, the nail marks, and he showed them, and Thomas could touch it. And then he says the following, peace to you. Just as the Father has sent me forth, so I'm sending you. And having said this, he breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. But listen 
Why? This is not acts. This is pre-acts. Now, having received the Holy Spirit and being led and directed by Him, if you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. Come on, church. Does that sound like a priest? If you forgive the sins of anyone, not somebody, not someone, anyone, their sins are forgiven. If you retain the sins of anyone, they are returned. And now our pride and our flesh will stand up and say, I will not forgive you. Then Matthew says, if you cannot forgive those who trespass against you, God cannot forgive you because you hold your unforgiveness, you hold it back, and it becomes a wall between, between you and God. But the power of forgiveness, the word forgiven was just boldly displayed. I saw forgiven, and listen to the tense, forgiven. Not forgive, forgiven. It's done. You are forgiven. And if I am connected to the ministry as a son to the priesthood of Christ, then I can stand here today and from that corner, that brother that's sleeping so nicely there, from that corner there, I can say you are forgiven, 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 forgiven. Come on, church, forgive it. Your sins are forgiven. To that young lady that's wide awake that side, you are forgiven. His spirit hurt, he's forgiven. But that lady, everyone, we have the power, come on church, to drive through a town, to walk in a nation, understanding that we are priests of the Most High and we can forgive nations. We can forgive people. We can speak forgiveness over this valley. Come on, church. That is a son understanding that he's also a priest. We can speak reconciliation. We can speak forgiveness. We can speak healing and restoration. And that is why I believe that God is taking us into an era where we truly start to understand the heavenly ministry, understanding the operation and the working of this divine ministry in Christ Jesus. Today, the band can come. We are going to anoint ourselves. And first of all, church, I don't want you to think about anyone else. No, God will deal with that later. But today, you're going to declare at that table, I am forgiven. Are you with me, church? I am forgiven. I receive today my forgiveness. And I will not be full of pride to exalt my guilt. Come on. I will not exalt my self-condemnation. I will not exalt my judgment above the forgiveness of God. Come on. I will not do that because then, my dearly beloved, you are full of yourself. We lift the blood of Jesus up. And today we're going to receive that forgiveness for ourselves and say, Lord, according to your word, according to your design and purpose and plan, I forgive. I receive my forgiveness today. I am forgiven. I lay a hold on this eternal life that has no past. Come on. There's no past in it. I am now here and I lay hold of it, of eternal life. The word says in Timothy, through the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed and immortality is revealed. In the light of this gospel, we lay hold of this immortal life that cannot die. 
this immortal reality that I'm forgiven. I lay hold of it today in Jesus' name. Also, church, that you will come to a place where you forgive yourself. Like I said, if you cannot forgive yourself, you have lifted yourself above God Almighty. You have lifted yourself above the blood of Jesus because He has forgiven you. Who are you not to forgive yourself? And I know I am one of those that is constantly, constantly there, always condemning myself. But I need to understand that when I do that, I'm full of self. I lift myself. My standard is so high, it's higher than God's. He already forgave me. And then I think, oh, Alma, you need to repent. You need to repent. You need to. And then you start that repenter until it's, it's you know, the rotten strip. You repent, you repent. You, it's like a creamer. Remember, children, we, we did the creaming. Die great machine, but you are off room. You dry it, and you, you turn that thing, and it turns, and it turns. And then you like, you, re, you, you repent until you strip the gears. Amen. Forgive yourself and then receive your freedom. And when we are truly free, church, when we truly are free, then forgiveness flows naturally from ourselves. It just flows. Are you with me? Today, say with me, I'm forgiven because of the blood of Jesus. Because he is my true high priest. And I receive it today. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for a better agreement. An eternal agreement. An eternal forgiveness. And an eternal salvation. We thank you. We thank you that you came and you paid the price for our sins, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we can stand here today blood washed, continually cleansed. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have communion with one another. And that the blood of Jesus is cleansing us, cleansing us, washing us from all sins and the manifestations of sins, Lord. By faith, we lay hold of this today. Our minds cannot fathom or understand this grace. Our minds want to measure and judge, and our minds want to calculate. But Lord, there's an eternal freedom in the blood of Jesus that no mind can calculate, but only can be received by faith. And therefore, Lord, we reach out with our faith today. We reach, Lord, with, with a humble heart and a weakness of understanding. But we reach out, Lord, and we say, by faith I lay hold of this in my life. I am forgiven. I am washed. And I am loved. And I'm made I made the righteousness of God. I made a king and a priest of the Most High. We lay hold of this by faith, Lord. And I thank you that you meet us. You meet our faith. You come and you meet our faith, Lord. And you lift us up into the realms of glory and into the realms of grace, Lord. You lift us up into the dimensions, Lord, where we can see around us and hear your voice interceding, praying, praying, praying for us, intervening for us, Lord. And thank you, Father, for the privilege to share that calling with our Lord Jesus, that we can pray for one another. Lord, as I call forth for everyone in this place, I know you hear me. I know you hear me, Lord. And that the prayer of the righteous availeth much power. Come and meet our unbelief, Lord. Come and help our unbelief. Come, Lord Jesus, help our unbelief so that we can lay hold, Lord. 
I bless my brothers and my sisters, Lord. And I thank you that this word will carry them, that this word will will teach them and this word will guide them and this word will make them aware of the power they are carrying, Lord, the power to forgive, to release people from their sins, to release one another. Let your name be glorified in us, Lord. Let your kingdom come on this earth as it is in heaven. Be blessed, my Father. Be blessed. What a salvation. (laughs) What a salvation. Unthinkable. Foolish. But what a salvation. forgiven.